So hello everybody, I'm happy to host Tom Levy. Uh, Omer is a senior lecturer at uh, Tel Aviv University and a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Uh, his research is in the field of natural language processing, particularly inter interested in creating NLP models that can generalize as well. So today we'll talk about uh, transformers more than meet the eyes. Uh, so Omer, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Elad. And uh, thank you all for, for inviting me here. Um, this talk is gonna be a bit technical. So, uh, and, I, and I'm not sure what everybody's background is. I'm, I'm guessing it's a pretty heterogeneous uh, 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 group. So uh, uh, if at any point I say something that that's not entirely clear, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. So, um, Unless you've uh, uh, been under uh, living under a, a, a rock or something <laughs> over the past year, few years, uh, then you must have heard the name Transformers. Uh, and apparently they, they, they've been everywhere in natural language processing, uh, but also in, in other fields such as uh, speech recognition and, and uh, image recognition. Um, and they're pretty much the, uh, I'd say, go-to architecture in deep learning today, uh, at least for, for, for a lot of, uh, of these kind of tasks. Um, some examples of transformers, uh, they, they come in kind of different flavors. Uh, the encoder transformer is very popular. Uh, it's used in BERT and uh, BERT derivatives uh, such as Roberta um, and other names of Muppets. Um, uh, there's, of course, the language modeling uh, variant, uh, which has become pretty popular over the past couple of years. Uh, GPT-3 is just one example uh, of, of a massive language model, uh, uh, probably the most prominent one nowadays. Um, and of course, uh, the original uh, way in which transformers were proposed was the, in the encoder-decoder uh, setting. Uh, which basically enables us to do sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks such as machine translation. Now, the main mechanism that uh, basically makes transformers work is something we call self-attention. Um, uh, and you kind of think of uh, transformers as kind of self-attention on steroids. And most of the, the works that, uh, the studies that, that kind of try to uh, understand what's going on in transformers are basically trying to analyze what's going on in the self-attention mechanism. However, transformers are not only made of self-attention, uh, but they're also uh, made of a few other components that basically uh, uh, surround or, or enhance self-attention. Uh, the fact that the self-attention is actually multi-head and not single-head is one contribution that came with along with transformers. Um, but there are also feed forward layers that appear in, in the network and actually com uh, comprise most of the parameters in the transformer network. And of course, uh, residual connections, uh, which without them, uh, we could not train uh, deep transformer networks. Now, the question I'm gonna ask today um, is, is why do we need them? Why do we need all these extra components? Why can't we just take a lot of self-attention uh, uh, layers, uh, sing, simple single, uh, single uh, head self-attention layers, uh, just stack them one on top of the other and you know, uh, pray to Bengio and hope that uh, 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 the model will converge. Um, so apparently, uh, bes besides the benefits uh, um, from, the, from the optimization angle that we get from these additional components, there are actually modeling benefits. Um, the mo what I'm going to try to convince you today is basically that the, the uh, multi-head self-attention allows the model to learn uh, some functions that it would not be able to express without multiple heads. The feed forward layers are actually acting as a, a kind of a memory component and storing actual examples or, or patterns that, that it saw in the training examples. 
and that the residual connections, besides allowing for, for very efficient uh, and, and clean gradient flow, they're also acting in the forward pass as kind of a refinement mechanism of the model's prediction. All right. Any questions before we uh, start? Before we dig in? As, um, so self-attention, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a very quick definition of, of what it is. Um, it's basically a um, weighted sum over the inputs. Okay, a weighted average, sorry, over the inputs. So if X is our input, A uh, is going to be a... Uh, um, if X, X is, a, um, you can think of X as an N by D uh, matrix. Just make it really clear and excuse my handwriting because I'm not using a proper pen. So you can think of X as an N by D matrix and A as a vector of, uh, as a matrix of weights N by N, where for each row in A, we basically have a probability distribution over the items in our input, okay? So if we have like 10 words in our sentence, then A is gonna be, the first row in A is gonna be uh, some probability distribution over these 10 words. And when we multiply A by X, we get a weighted average of um, each word in the sentence where the, the, the weights in A are basically determined by um, the some similarity for, uh, by the similarity or some kind of uh, a parameterized similarity function between X1, which was the first word uh, in our sentence, the one that we're computing the weights for uh, when we look at the first row in A and every other word in the sentence, okay? Yeah. All right. By the way, the reason it's called self-attention versus uh, regular attention is because basically every token is being con every token in, in the input sequence is being contextualized by everything else else in the sentence, including itself. Okay, so it's basically attending on itself. So, so it's actually the probability of having one token uh, uh, with another token? It's, the, token. The, it's um, we're going to try to represent each token as a weighted average of all the tokens in the sentence. Okay, and the way we're gonna weight these different tokens is by some kind of parameterized uh, uh, similarity function um, where the parameters are basically going to tell us how much contextual information we're going to get from those uh, from, from those uh, different tokens. Okay, thanks. Okay. So why do we need multi-head attention and not just single, uh, a single head uh, of attention? Um, so, so the, the underlying theoretical question is basically, can uh, single head attention express the same kind of functions that uh, multi-head attention can express? It's a completely theoretical question. And we can even reduce that to a, a much simpler question. Can single head attention ex express uh, the functions that a two head attention can express? Um, and I gave this uh, a couple of days ago uh, uh, as a class exercise um, where you can basically reduce it to uh, prove or refute uh, for every uh, uh, two sets of attention weights and two sets of uh, these Ws are basically the kind of output uh, 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 transformations that we ha usually have in attention and an input X. Um, there exists some kind of attention weight and output uh, matrix such that they equal. And of course we can find a negative example 
um, where this is not the case, where there does not exist some kind of A and W that express uh, this part of the equation. Um, and therefore, um, multi-head attention cannot be emulated by single-head attention. It is strictly more expressive. Now, I, I don't think that anybody published this, but it, it seems like a, kind of a, a very straightforward thing, and that's why I give it as a class exercise. But we're going to rely on this intuition now to, to think about multi-head attention. So, so we know that, that multi-head attention is theoretically more expressive than single head attention. It uh, doesn't matter empirically. Yes. Excuse me. Like, uh, uh, I, I think uh, I understand the logic, but uh, maybe you need to do the other way around, right? Like, uh, uh, you, you must prove the left side can do everything in the right side, right? No, the right side is the single head attention. Uh, so, so, okay. Like, uh, I, I want to show that there is a case there is some case that I thought about yeah, on yeah. the left side that no matter what I put in A and W, I'm never going to get an equality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, you, you want to show the, uh, you, you want to conclude that single hair is always better than, uh, but no, no, M multiple hair is always better than single hair, right? You want to say that... I, I didn't say better, I said more expressive. More expressive, that, okay. There are things that I can express with two heads there are yeah. functions that I can express with two heads that, that I cannot emulate with a single head. Yeah, so, but then you, you need to also so, show that like uh, uh, the, the left side can do everything the right side can, can do, right? The left I think side... that's trivial. That's trivial because yeah, you yeah, can just the... say A1 is zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like A2 and A, uh, equals A and W2 equals W. Yeah, uh, but uh, like, uh, do you need to like maybe like a uh, uh, con constrain the number of parameters or like, yeah, okay, okay. Maybe it's a tri trivial. Okay, 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 cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's a trivial. So, yeah. you, can, you can just like, yeah, ignore all the heads except for one and you get, you get yeah, the yeah, same. Okay, okay. okay. So, so it doesn't matter empirically that, you know, we have this nice theoretical result. Okay. Well, let's go back yeah. to the, the original. Uh, I'll, I'll just finish this point and, and I'll, I'll take questions, okay? Um, let's go back to the, um, the original transformer paper, attention is all you need, and, and look at what they did. Look, look at the experiments that they ran, and they actually compared what happens when you train a transformer with only single head attention. And you see this result here, this is blue in translation, so higher is better, uh, versus when, when you try it with multiple heads, and this is, a, this is a controlled for the number of parameters. So the number of parameters doesn't change, but we can see that we get higher results when we train, somewhat higher results when we train with um, multiple heads versus a single head. Yeah, there, there was a question here. Uh, yes. Um, so generally, all new networks are essentially universal in the extreme case, right? If the network is large enough, you can do anything. So simply showing that uh, uh, locally the operation of multi-head, uh, sorry, so single head attention can't uh, emulate uh, two head attention, th that doesn't seem sufficient to show that it's strictly more expressive on its own, right? So is very proof for the network as a whole, if it's limited to single head, uh, they still can't, uh, using composition. Uh, That's a great question. Yeah, so, so uh, first of all, I, I, I do want to just emphasize one of the things you said that when the network is large enough, but you know, we're kind of very greedy when it comes to, net, to, to deep learning and we always want bigger and bigger networks. And in practice, we have actually you know, networks of limited size. So, so the size does matter and the limits, the, the limits are real. Um, but, but it is true that you could think of um, this, um, uh, you know, you might not need multi-head in parallel if you had uh, multiple heads in different layers. Um, we did not, we did not uh, uh, um, control for that in, the, in, in, in this work that I'm gonna present in a second, um, but we'll see that the, the, that the network does, um, 
is still going to learn uh, interesting things at, at, at each layer. It's still going to utilize uh, the multi-head functionality, even though you might be able to emulate it by just creating more layers and spreading out the heads across the, the different layers. Okay. So we did see in, in, in this, this chart that I showed that um, multi-head attention does perform somewhat better, at least in this, this uh, experiment on machine translation. Um, and, and, and we know from other work that, that this is also the case. Like it, it does matter if, if you allow the model to use uh, more heads, uh, it can reach better results. Um, so there are two hypotheses that could explain this observation. And I'm not immediately saying, yes, it matters empirically, but be, be, because there are <laughs> two ex uh, possible explanations. One is uh, um, kind of this direction that, that we're going towards with, with, with the intuition that we had from the theoretical result, uh, multi-head attention, MHA is this, this uh, uh, shortcut that I'm going to use throughout the, uh, the talk. Uh, multi-head attention uh, learns complex functions that single head cannot. And, and I mean, it's not only that it can learn, which is what the theoretical result tells us, but we're, we're, th this hypothesis is basically saying it does learn them in practice. And the competing hypothesis is that uh, multi-head attention actually learns better single-head attention functions because it can try out a lot of things uh, during optimization. So it might be that this empirical benefit that we're seeing uh, comes from the fact that uh, kind of this you know, connection to the lottery ticket hypothesis that we're trying out a lot of different heads. And at the end of the day, uh, it's just gonna use one of them um, and it's gonna it's gonna throw out the rest, but, but maybe use them as kind of you know to beam search throughout the uh, parameter space uh, during optimization. So we want to figure out which of these hypotheses uh, is correct, and that's basically what we tried to do in this paper that we had uh, at Neurips uh, uh, a year and a half ago. Um, are sixteen heads really better than one? Uh, and this is joint work with, with Paul Michel and uh, Graham Neubig from CMU. Um, so uh, we designed the following experiment. We train an encoder-decoder transformer for machine translation. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, and at inference, we're gonna mask some of the attention heads. When I say mask, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're basically going to ignore them. We're going to nullify them, set them all to zeros, um, and, and just run the, net, run the forward pass as if they don't exist. <coughs> we're then going to measure uh, the difference in performance after we mask uh, each subset of tension heads. And again, the performance is going to be blue uh, because uh, we're talking about machine translation. So um, this is an example of the encoder self-attention. There are three sets of, of, of attention um, that the model can use, uh, self-attention, encoder-decoder, cross-attention, and uh, self-attention on the decoder side, uh, which is often called causal attention. Um, and we can see uh, that if we drop a single head at each time, the results are not going to change that much. So blue is, blue is a score that goes from zero to 100. So we're talking about less than 1% um, in, in, in delta, uh, delta of less than 1%. In most of these cases, it's less than even um, one tenth of a percent. So these are really, really minor changes. We see that most of the heads can actually be dropped um, without any, any uh, uh, um, terrible effect. What happens when we do leave one in instead of leave one out? So uh, what happens if we take one head and drop everything else? And, and let's say we can even choose the best head uh, uh, for each layer. In this case, we see that most of the layers can actually work well with a single head, but some layers, and in particular, the last layer in the encoder-decoder attention um, 
does require multiple heads. It does learn a function. It does utilize the fact that um, multiple heads can express a more complex function and it learns a more complex function. We cannot select just a single head uh, in this case. <coughs> Finally, uh, we tried to mask uh, a growing number of heads. And again, we see that a, um, in the encoder decoder attention, the more heads we prune, uh, we, we actually get a faster drop in performance. And, and this is probably because this, this kind of encoder decoder attention between uh, the source language and the target language is relying on this more sophisticated functionality of attention. Whereas uh, uh, the uh, encoder attention, the decoder attention, which only focus on the source only or the target only, um, don't actually require that functionality or don't actually learn something that, that requires that functionality. Uh, can I ask something? Sure. Uh, first thing about the masks, the increasing number of mass uh, heads you were masking, did you have uh, some kind of uh, sophisticated algorithm to choose which heads to mask or random yeah. permutations of the number of heads? No, we, we had a heuristic. We had a, uh, it was uh, something related to the gradients. I don't actually remember the, the details of that one. Okay, and in the tests before, what I wanted to ask, did you do any other tests of just like you showed here, uh, dropping one and dropping n min i n minus one? Uh, yeah. Did you do any kind of uh, sortings of testing uh, intertwined uh, numbers of uh, masks? Um, we did it, but not in a, not rigorously. Okay. Um, we, we did get some kind of, you know, uh, manual selection of things. Um, <clears throat> in, in most cases, you, you, see, you see an effect that, that's more like this. Like you can, you can drop quite a, few, a, a bit of heads uh, at each layer uh, before things uh, go south. Um, again, it's, it's this particular layer that we, we noticed that, um, that is more sensitive uh, to, to dropping heads. Um, but, but yeah, but it, it, even here you can drop, you can probably drop like more than half of the heads and nothing will happen. Can I ask a question too? Sure. Here you just train it over a lot of heads and you drop all of them except for one, right? Yeah. So it all, might be all, all of them in the same layer. Yeah. Oh, okay. The other layers are not affected. It can be claimed that if you were to train the network in the beginning with only one head, it would have better performances, right? Yeah, so it, uh, I'll go back to, to what happens when you train with the single head, um, then performance does go down, but not by a lot. It does go down. So it, we're talking about like minus uh, 0 0.9. Um, of course, I mean, we're, we're kind of surprising the network by, by pruning heads, right? This is not something that it expected. It's not something that it saw during training. Um, but what, what we found interesting was that um, when given the ability to learn a more complex function, it chooses to do it in some cases. In, in, in some layers, it chooses to, to learn a more sophisticated function. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, uh, going back to our two hypotheses, um, we see, uh, again, that, is it that the model learns more complex functions or <clears throat> that it just learns better single head attention functions? It seems like from, from these experiments that in some cases, it, it, it does actually learn more complex functions um, and, and it, it does utilize this extra expressivity. <clears throat> But, but it's probably a rather limited phenomenon uh, uh, that, that's limited to, to very particular layers. All right. So uh, we talked about multi-head attention. 
Uh, and let's let's talk about uh, the next big component: uh, feed-forward layers. What, why why do we actually need them? <laughs> okay, one more question. Sure. You talked uh, before about uh, increasing the number of heads and more complex functions that you learn, and you showed that when you jump when they first did their empirical tests when they did the uh, thirty-two, there was a little decrease in the results. Yeah. Is there is it like uh, the beginning of uh, networks like uh, depth is king and or is there some kind of uh, uh, idea about the residuals and vanishing? Uh, uh, I, no, I think it's it, it's more related to um, so, so to keep to keep the basically the number of parameters the same. Um, what you have to do is you have to have kind of a sub-dimension for each head. And you can see here, it's, it's a bit grayed out, but you can see that the sub-dimension goes down. And yeah. basically when you have 32 heads, then each head has 16 dimensions. And that might be just not, not enough to express the kind of relations you want to learn. Um, the, the current kind of practice, uh, at least in NLP, is that each head has 64 dimensions. You try to keep that constant and if you enlarge the model, if you say like the, the, the dimension is no longer 512, but it's now 1024, then instead of eight heads, I'm gonna have 16 heads at each dimension. And that seems to work well and scale well. Empirically. But... Empirically, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so let's talk about feed forward networks. Um, so each transformer layer is basically it's not only uh, just multi-head self-attention. Um, the multi-head, the result from the multi-head self-attention is basically fed into a feed-forward layer, uh, and there's of course residual connections as well. Um, and uh, like I said at the beginning, there, there's been quite a bit of, of analysis uh, on multi-head attention. Uh, but nobody's been, uh, nobody's tried to understand what's going on in these feed forward layers, uh, which, is, which is kind of surprising given the fact that two thirds of the model is actually feed forward layers. Um, we typically use um, uh, something like 8D squared uh, for each feed forward layer. That's kind of the standard hyperparameter setting, whereas the multi head attention usually takes up 4D squared. So what's going on, going on in these, in these uh, layers? Um, what I'm going to try to show you uh, and convince you, hopefully, is, is based on this new work that, that started actually as a course project last year uh, and turned into a paper. Uh, this is still under review. Um, and we basically showed that uh, uh, these feedforward layers in the transformer are acting as memory cells, as key value memories. So uh, I'm first gonna show you that in theory, uh, feed forward layers can be cast as key value memories. I'm then gonna show you that empirically when you look at the keys, you will see that they capture textual patterns from the input and actually from the training examples, from the input of the training examples. The values uh, uh, are gonna, be correlated, we, we can actually uh, uh, produce distributions from them of the output vocabulary of the, the next word that we're trying to predict if we're doing language modeling. Um, and, and there is a connection between the, the output distribution, the distributions that they predict and the kind of textual patterns that are related to the same keys. And finally, I'm gonna show that the residual, con that, that um, sorry, that each uh, uh, feed forward layer's output is actually a composition of multiple values. So it's rarely the case that one single memory cell is gonna kind of take over the, the prediction. It's usually uh, a lot of these different uh, memory cells that kind of combine and, and, and reach kind of the, this compromise prediction uh, at each layer. And this prediction, which is produced by each layer is actually refined throughout the model, throughout the depth of the model, 
via the residual connection. So the residual connections are not only going to be useful for, for training the model for passing gradients along, they're also going to be useful for passing the predictions forward. OK, so let's first show uh, talk about what a memory network is and what, what do I mean when I say uh, memory cells? So a memory network uh, can be seen as basically uh, some distribution over memory cells, which is computed uh, by taking the input. The input is a vector, a d-dimensional vector, and comparing it with a bunch of keys. With like, Let's say we have uh, um, n keys. So this can be seen as, uh, um, after transposition, can be seen as a d by n matrix. OK, and the values are also we have n values and each of these values is also a vector. OK, so we take the input, um, compute its similarity to each one of these keys, pass it through a softmax to get kind of a distribution and then compute a weighted average over the values. That's basically neural memory. OK, so every row in K basically represents a key. We're going to uh, denote this as ki uh, using, using uh, blue letters. Um, and every row is going to be in orange. It's going to represent the value. Every row in V is going to represent a value. Um, and like I said, the inner product between uh, the input and the keys is basically going to determine the distribution over the values. Um, finally, I'm, I'm just going to use another, uh, 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 I'm just going to denote one other value, which is uh, what we're going to call the memory coefficient, mi, which is basically the, the strength of the similarity between the input and a key, or how much does the input uh, trigger a certain key. Now, if we look at, trend, uh, at the feed-forward letter layers in a transformer, uh, we can immediately see that they look very, very similar to neural memory. Um, the, perhaps the only difference is that we're using a ReLU nonlinearity non instead of a softmax. So we can think of the uh, uh, feedforward layers as emulating an unnormalized uh, memory network. And uh, the interesting question, of course, is, OK, if, if, if these feed forward networks are memories, uh, what memories do they store? What kind of information uh, do they hold for the network? So we ran an experiment where we basically asked, what kind of uh, information do the keys capture? And um, what we did was compute the memory coefficient um, for every training example over every key. So um, give, uh, given a key, we're basically going to run all the, all the training data through it and see what kind of training examples are going to kind of uh, trigger it. OK, so we're going to select the, uh, the 25 examples uh, that triggered uh, uh, this uh, specific memory, the specific key, uh, the most. And then we're going to uh, just eyeball these examples. We're going we're gonna to have human annotators that look at these examples and look for patterns that appear in at least three out of 25 examples. We're going we're gonna to try to annotate also like multiple of uh, uh, patterns like these. The reason we're taking at least uh, three is that, um, you know, humans are very, very uh, good at seeing patterns where they don't exist. Uh, so we have something in our annotation uh, uh, process that basically forces people to say, OK, if you, if you recognized a pattern, if you defined a pattern, now you have to give me at least three examples from the data where you saw this example happen. Uh, and, and that makes the, the annotations much more consistent. I will say one more thing that, that I didn't mention earlier. We're talking about a language model here. So um, the task is basically given a prefix of, sorry given a prefix of, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, n words, uh, predict the next word. OK, so our examples, when I say training example x, I basically mean a prefix of a sentence uh, and not a complete sentence. So let's look at the kind of uh, patterns we saw. Um, 
Here's one of the keys. This is from the first layer. You can see K1. Uh, uh, this is dimension 449 out of a, a, a real uh, language model that was state of the art a, a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see that all of the examples uh, in this pattern uh, basically contain the word substitutes um, at the end. So this, is kind of, this is like a real feature uh, in, in, in the classical machine learning sense. Uh, we call these kind of patterns shallow. We also see patterns that are could be seen as shallow, but th th they're slightly more semantic. So uh, in this case, we'll see base or bases. So there's already some kind of variation. Uh, but in addition, all of these uh, 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 examples um, use base in the in the military sense. So these are not like you know bases in linear algebra or, or uh, any other uh, 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 interpretation of, of base. This, uh, by the way, you can see this example is in the sixth layer. So this is a kind of mid-network. The network has 16 layers in total. Um, just to make sure that I understand, you gave them, uh, you tried a, uh, another training uh, prefix that the word bases or base was supposed to be uh, instead, but not in the military. Uh, aspect and saw that you didn't get the same kind of uh, no. Uh, reaction? We, when we look at the top twenty-five, then the best pattern, the, the the strictest pattern that we can define, is base in the military. Mil military ends with base. This is literally from what people annotated. And there, the, I mean, if they saw other cases of base. Uh, that, that were not military uh, in the top 25 examples, then they would annotate those. It would be simpler to annotate those. But, but the, what they found is that uh, in this example, bases occurred or base or bases occurred only in the military sense. Now, when we go up the network to, to the 10th layer, we start seeing uh, semantic uh, uh, patterns um, such as the, the part of relation. So she was named as one of the team that, whatever. Uh, he was also a part of the Indian delegation. Toy Story is also among the top 10, etc. So these are already like paraphrases and we can see that they're no longer appearing kind of at the end of the sentence uh, where the kind of local information for predicting the next word is, is mostly gonna appear. Now, if we look at it in, in a more macro sense, um, then we can see that in general, um, we found explanations for most of the, of the uh, top 25 examples that we saw. So most of the top 25 uh, examples were part of a larger cluster within that top 25. Um, I can tell you that from these, uh, the red parts, the, the or red or gray, I. I'm, I'm colorblind, so I'm not sure which color this is. Uh, the not covered parts, um, basically, uh, um, uh, a lot of these examples did were part of clusters, but clusters that appeared lower in the rank. So if you took the top 50, uh, you could probably uh, match them to, to other clusters. So uh, this is kind of a very, very conservative estimate of, of what the amount of coverage is. Um, in the begin, what's also interesting is that at the beginning of the network, up to la layer nine, we see that shallow layers dominate. Most of these uh, uh, shallow patterns dominate. Uh, most of the patterns are, are, are kind of, you know, very, very kind of surface form. Uh, the last word is this or something like that. Whereas at layer 10, some kind of magic happens and the network begins to behave differently or the memories begin to behave differently. Um, and we see much more semantic behavior. Any questions before I proceed? Uh, okay. Excuse me? Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I, I, I'm no uh, MLP guy. So uh, like uh, 
But like, uh, is there a way to do this automatically? Like, uh, uh, maybe use the departing tree or like uh, uh, this thing. So I, I mean, like uh, some way uh, you, you can do in a large yeah, scale, no using human annotation. That's a great question. Um, probably, probably, but you might need to get some training data for that. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, our analysis is correct. Okay. Uh, so that's why we use human annotation. We actually did it in-house. We did it within the lab. Um, we annotated um, 10, 10, we just sampled 10 dimensions for each layer. Uh, so we had 160 dimensions in total. Um, and, and we gave like each person to annotate a few, a few of these dimensions. Um, so, so, I mean, we're, we're pretty sure that this, this is a good estimate of what's happening. But of course, it would be better if we could do this, you know, act accurately and automatically. Okay. Okay. So, um, in total, we can say that basically keys um, capture input patterns. They capture patterns that we see in the input examples. But what about the values? Is there some connection between what the values represent and these input patterns that we see in the keys? So to test what the values represent, we basically computed the output prediction for each value VI. So we took VI and basically said, assume that VI was the output of the entire model, the output of the transformer stack. Let's take it and compare it to the, the embeddings of the output words, the output embeddings, and basically say, what would the model predict if this was the output? So we can think of VI as kind of a distribution over the output words, over the, 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 the output embeddings. Um, <clears throat> sorry, over this, the, 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 the space of possible outputs. Um, but uh, for, for technical reasons that I actually don't, don't want to get too much into, um, VI is not a, a normalized distribution. Um, so uh, we decided to just take like the argmax um, instead of actually looking at it as a distribution. But there is some more analysis of that in, in, in the paper as well. So we're looking just at the argmax of like which word would VI predict if it was uh, the, the model's output. Um, and we basically compare these predictions to the, to the outputs of the input examples. So if we had, uh, take an example, um, let's say Toy Story is, almost, is also among the top 10 in the BFI list of the, uh, of the 50, uh, sorry, of the 50 fil films you should see. So see, or watch is the out, is the actual output, and we're wondering if the if the value that correlates with this key that matches this with this key, uh, which is v ten the the uh, two nine nine seven. Um, I'm just going to write this, um, which is the matching value to this key, uh, actually predicts the word c. Okay, that's what we're gonna try to, to check. So what we found was that um, there is some agreement um, and this, the amount of agreement goes up as we go in the network. So uh, again, there's this kind of magical thing that happens at around layer 10, where suddenly the network uh, begins to behave in a different way. Uh, these are very small percentages I will add because um, these are fairly, this is a fairly uh, a conservative estimate of, of whether, uh, of whether uh, there is a connection between the value and, and the, uh, uh, the patterns that we saw in the keys. Um, the reason is that in general, values are supposed to be interpreted as um, output probabilities, as probability distributions and not as discrete predictions, but because of what I said earlier that we can't actually treat this as a, as a normalized distribution, uh, we had to take the, the, just the argmax instead of the entire distribution. 
Um, if we look at the micro level uh, and, and, and look at basically how many of these examples are covered, we can see that it, at least in the top layers, we see that there's, there is actually decent coverage uh, of these top examples, top input examples that are associated with, with each memory cell. So you can see, for example, in some cases we have like 92%, 84%, 68%, but there are of course other cases where we have much lower agreement. Any questions? All right. So um, in general, what, what, we what we find is that basically values do represent some kind of output distributions. Um, and in many cases, they are actually uh, uh, linked to the, uh, the patterns that we see in the, uh, that are captured by the, the, the respective keys. Um, and I will add that this is, this is a phenomenon that is, is stronger as we go up the network and, and, and it's more prevalent there. To summarize what, what, what we talked about so far, um, we can look at basically this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, diagram uh, where we have uh, uh, this input stay with you for a something and we, the model needs to guess what something is. Um, we have a bunch of transformer layers that lead up to this la specific layer. Um, uh, and inside, after we do self-attention, we basically get this representation of X5. It's the representation that represents uh, the token A or, or more correctly, the prefix that came before the token A. This is what X5 is gonna represent. And then we show that basically, if we look at each one of these keys, uh, the model is gonna is gonna find more correlation with keys that that basically uh, get triggered when uh, uh, these kind of patterns occur, and of course the value is gonna reflect the next word, the following word that that tends to occur after these kind of patterns. In this case, it would be while. So this is what we saw until now. And um, one of the questions that, 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 that we're still left with, with is, how does the model compose the output from so many of these memories and over so many of these layers? So just a reminder, at each, la at, at each layer, we have actually 4,000 memory cells. And we have 16 layers in this model. So, so how do we get to the, like this, this final output distribution from each one of these um, very, very kind of uh, specific uh, memory that, that kind of has a, you know, that, that is kind of, um, is an expert on, on a very, very particular set of patterns. So what we found is, is, is that we have two kind of composition mechanisms. The first one is what we're gonna call the intralayer memory composition mechanism. Um, it's basically how we compose uh, uh, the prediction at each layer, but not between layers. So if we take a look at the uh, uh, feed forward layer uh, of the transformer, uh, it basically looks like this. This is how we, we would write it with matrices. Uh, but if we want to kind of break it down to a, a uh, sum, then we can look at it like this, um, where uh, basically the, the memory coefficient or the, the uh, um, memory coefficient after the nonlinearity is going to be m tag uh, m prime i, and that's going to be kind of a scalar, uh, a weight uh, that's going to weigh how much each of these values is going to affect the output. So um, how often is the, the layers prediction, the entire layers prediction different from all of the values prediction? How often is this sum, does this sum end up predicting something else that, that is not the top answer, the top, the top uh, uh, prediction of each one of these components VIs? Okay, so we tested this and it turns out that it happens 
quite, that it's quite often the case that in, 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 in most of the cases, um, we find that <clears throat> the model um, d- basically finds some kind of compromise between all of these memories um, that does not necessarily occur, that is not necessarily the top result of each one, of, of, of an individual memory. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> we also see that um, um, the effect of a single memory kind of, uh, of single memory, so the, basically the, this gap that we're seeing here um, becomes a bit more prevalent um, as we go up uh, as, as we go up the model uh, near the end, uh, we do have some cases where, where basically single memories have a larger effect on on the uh, uh, final output. <coughs> so um, we 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 do see that each layer's output is a composition of multiple values, but um, how does each layer's prediction contribute to the final output? And this is where it gets a bit interesting because up until now, um, the residual connection uh, was assumed to be something that, that kind of just, you know, is, is very good for optimization, but I don't think there, there is much work on uh, how the residual connection can actually contribute to, uh, to the forward pass, to the, to the modeling itself. So it turns out that the residual connection is gonna is gonna play uh, a kind of refinement role. It's gonna it's gonna act as kind of a refinement mechanism between layers. So um, we, we we when we look at the residual connection, we can basically say, okay, it's kind of adding another memory cell, okay, but without without any uh, uh, um, coefficient to it. And um, to kind of try to analyze uh, what's going on with this residual connection, we're gonna ask two questions. So first of all, at which layer does the residual connection already contain the model's final prediction? So kind of, uh, if I need to say it in Hebrew, um, when, when does the model kind of reach the decision? Um, and, Another question that's gonna guide us in this analysis is, is how often does the feed forward layer actually change the residual layers, the, 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 the prediction that, that, that comes out of the uh, residual uh, connection. So for the first one, when we, when we try to see like when the residual is already uh, predicting uh, the, the final outcome, uh, we see that it, it starts pretty early. So already at the third layer or uh, fourth layer, we can see that uh, uh, in a quarter of cases, the residual is already predicting uh, the final outcome. And again, uh, this is kind of gradually goes up, but very slowly. And, and at the 10th layer or so, uh, some kind of magic starts to happen and, um, <laughs> the 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 model uh, starts to converge towards uh, the final output. So the residual connection is is in many cases uh, it it already kind of carries the decision from a lower layer and just kind of uh, forces it upon uh, the more upper layers. Omer, yes. Uh, um... I would wonder like how much this is a function of the uh, receptive field size that is needed. Like, like if it's for, it needs to integrate from like longer context then maybe the, it takes more time to decide or it's something else. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think we actually checked this, um, but you could think of an, an experiment where, or at least some kind of analysis where you say, let's look at the subset of of examples that were predicted very early on and see if they're kind of like, you know, stop words or stuff like that, that, that the model would predict with only local information. Um, and and I, I, guess, I guess it would make sense that, that that would be the case. Like we saw that the patterns in the lower case, in the, in the lower layers 
much more local. Um, so my my hypothesis would be that the, that's actually the case. Like if you had uh, so German, we, for example, you have you know at the you might have at the beginning you know not and then like a whole sentence at the end and then at the end so it's gonna flip like the prediction or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could absolutely that. have that or or you know co-references or stuff like that. Yeah. that you you know you, you need. Uh, yeah, you, you need much more context. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks. Any more questions about this? Well, actually, uh, just uh, like what is like what we were talking about. Uh, did was there any tests on uh, different languages to see that this is a cohesive? This is something a property of the modeling itself and not the language itself. Um, yeah, so we ran all these experiments on a big uh, English language uh, uh, language model. Um, my guess is that this would be true for language modeling in any language, in any natural language. Um, I don't know if this would be the case if we looked at, I don't know, biological sequences, um, code, um, or if we did something that is not language modeling, if we, if we had a transformer that did something else. I, I don't know if that would be the case. Um, my guess is that some of these effects would, would actually stay, um, but it could be that, that, that that's not the case. Okay, so uh, Let's um, also look at, at the, the second question. How often does the feed forward layer actually change the prediction that's being carried on uh, uh, by the residual? And actually we see that in most of the cases, the residual kind of uh, you know, stays put. It, it, it doesn't actually change that much. We're talking about um, after we get, we get to layer three, about 20% or less of the cases that are influenced, that, are, that, that change uh, uh, because of the feed forward layer. And in the vast majority of cases, we're talking about composition. So composition means that the resulting prediction is not the residual and not the prediction of the feed forward layer. It's some kind of compromise candidate, okay? Um, we didn't do too much analysis of this in the paper, but from like initial results, it it seems that, and take this with a grain of salt, it seems that what the uh, feed forward layer does is basically knock out some of the top predictions in the residual and say what uh, not to predict. So it basically lowers the probability of some of these candidates and then like uh, candidate number two or number three or number four become the top candidates uh, uh, from the residual. Okay, so that's why I'm, I'm basically calling this some kind of a refinement mechanism. The residual comes up with with the distribution, and then it, it this distribution is is going to get altered uh, by the feed forward layer, but very very gently. Okay. Any more questions about this? All right, so let's finish up because uh, we're almost out of time. Um, so uh, we talked about transformers and how uh, they're mainly built of this uh, self-attention mechanism. Uh, but we also showed that there are additional components that are worth uh, looking into and understanding how they contribute to the, the overall prediction that the transformers create. Uh, we talked about how multi-head self-attention increases the expressivity of uh, the attention functions, and that in some cases the model does use uh, this, this extra expressivity uh, uh, to uh, uh, learn more complex functions. We saw that the feed-forward layers, which comprise two-thirds of the model's uh, parameters, are actually memory cells, and that they uh, store uh, patterns that occurred in the, in the training that, that they found in the training data and basically the, the um, uh, distribution of the output uh, outputs that, would that are supposed to follow these patterns. 
And finally, we talked about the, uh, fun the function of the residual connections uh, that can be seen as some kind of refinement mechanism to refine the model's prediction over uh, 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 the depth of the model. And uh, that's all for now. Any questions? Um, yeah, I have uh, one question. Um, you talked about uh, feed-forward uh, layers as memory mm -hmm. component, um, and you described uh, like three kind of patterns that uh, you found out there. Mm -hmm. If I understood correctly, one of them was like specific words, right? One of mm -hmm. them were some combination of a word and its um, uh, context or near context, maybe. Um, and some of them were more uh, semantic. Yeah. You find out some patterns that relate to more uh, syntactic. Um, uh, um, Absolutely. Yeah. We do find, we, we, we do see that. Yeah. So sorry, sorry to. Uh, Dependencies, uh, negations, things like that. Yeah. Um, so, so I'll add that when we say, we try to keep it very simple. So um, uh, basically these kind of shallow slash semantic patterns, um, I, th I think a lot of these patterns that you described would fall into them. Uh, we do th see cases where, for example, the next word is supposed to be a verb or the next word is supposed to be, uh, I'll, I'll give you actually a, a more concrete example. We see, um, uh, uh, superlatives, um, so like uh, the best, the most, uh, stuff like that, uh, that are kind of borderline between sort of syntactic and sem semantic. Um, the sh some of the shallow patterns strictly indicate uh, a, sem a syntactic pro property. So for example, if you'd have the or a or an, it would it would indicate that the following word or the following phrase at least is 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 an am phrase. Um, we 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 do see kind of these patterns. Um, I'll add that we also see uh, things that are much more high level semantics in the semantic pattern. So we see, for example, topics, but th but they're usually very like kind of um, focused topics. So um, for example, when I was doing some of these annotated uh, annotations, I saw. Uh, a lot of examples talk about uh, breeding in insects, like se sexual reproduction in insects. Um, so we're talking about like very, very focused information, but semantic. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? So do you have uh, like any thoughts on where like improvements to transformers maybe from stemming from these results? Uh... Yeah, so um, I actually had a few more slides at the end, but I knew I, I wouldn't reach them because this is a bit of, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a, bit of a dense talk. Um, but uh, I, in general, I believe that, you know, once you understand what's going on in, in the model, that, then you have much better intuition to make, to make breakthroughs. Um, I will say that in parallel to this work, we see a lot of um, uh, work, uh, I'll, I'll maybe mention two, two uh, papers in particular, one from friends at, at Facebook in Seattle and one from Google that came out about a month before of the switch transformers that are basically trying to uh, enlarge the number of parameters in the feedforward net networks uh, dramatically. Um, using all sorts of sparsity tricks that basically allow them to kind of, you know, uh, uh, bring in the relevant memories for the relevant examples, but store most of this memory offline, not on the GPU, but on, on RAM or on the disk. So uh, it could definitely be seen as some kind of extension of this uh, or, or, you know, using the same intuition that, that we used. Uh, cool. There's also the work, um, uh, from uh, uh, Guillaume Lampel, 
uh, that he did, I think, at the end of his PhD, where, where they did, they, they kind of had an alternative uh, feed forward network, which was much larger, again, using some kind of sparsity trick. Um, but they showed that this, this can dramatically improve performance in language modeling. Thanks. I'm mean, a quick thought, uh, just a question. Um, the inverse of your exper ex experiment can maybe help you prune out like uh, unwanted biases from the network because you sort of randomized a representation and saw what the receptive field in terms of meaning, but now you can put in gender bias and just prune that memory out and you have the same network uh, without the bad biases. Do you think about that? That is a great question and a great suggestion. Uh, we had a course project last year that was trying to do something similar, not exactly with biases, but trying to prune out um, <clears throat> uh, private information. So like if you, if you train a language model, you know, on data that contains, for example, your uh, Tudat Zehut, your credit card number, stuff like that, the model's actually gonna memorize this shit. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and of course we, we, you know, we don't want uh, people to type uh, stuff in, in, in Google Suggest and, and actually get you know, other people's private information. You know, the password is, and then get some kind of password. Um, so uh, they tried to do something similar. This was, that project was conducted concurrently with this. Um, so they didn't use exactly the same mechanism. They used a different mechanism, but they did find that um, there are like the, they could pinpoint the exact memories where this happened. Um, but and 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 this is this is where things get problematic. If you nullify that memory, so just that row of V, mm -hmm. um, you're actually gonna uh, uh, hurt a few other things as well. So each memory cell. Is not contain does not contain a single pattern, but it contains multiple patterns. They might be completely unrelated. By the way, uh, there's like some kind of sense into if you think about it that these patterns are kind of orthogonal, and then like when the model does its composition, it kind of zeroes out which patterns are relevant. Um, <clears throat> but basically, um, if you destroy a complete memory cell. Uh, you're going to destroy not only the information about that private information, but also other information that is useful for the for the model to, to make its predictions. Seems so solvable, it's, but, but yeah. It's, uh, you know, you know, you know uh, 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 neurosurgery, basically. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Okay, so if there are no more questions, so thank you, Omer, for this great talk. And uh, we'll see you all, all in uh, two weeks from now because uh, next week is uh, Yom Matsumut, Independence Day. Uh, so again, thank you, Omer. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was great fun. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Hope yeah. to see you in the flesh yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.